So in this video, we're going to take a look at uh, ISA's individual savings accounts. Very important part of any investor's portfolio and something that you ought to be thinking about uh, around about now. In a moment, I'll explain why. Now, why would you even want an ISA? Why go to the trouble of setting one up? Well, if I told you that based on some moneysupermarket.com figures, anyone who didn't use a cash ISA since 1999 as a basic rate taxpayer has missed out on over £3,000, and anybody who's a higher rate taxpayer has missed out on over £6,000 of tax breaks, you might be a little bit annoyed. Um, so, ISAs, an important part of any investor's portfolio, and we're going to start with why you need one. And the simple answer is tax. Basically, an ISA is not a product. There's a bit of confusion there. An ISA is simply a way of wrapping a product to protect it from tax. So imagine, if you will, I've chosen a product. That could be shares, uh, eligible investments as they're called. It could be bonds. It could be some kind of fund. And I've decided I want to invest. All I do with an ISA is put a wrapper around the outside. And that wrapper protects my investments from tax. Not all taxes, but two of the most important ones. And we'll look at which those are in just a moment. So, <clears throat> important point about ISAs, first of all, is they're not a product in their own right. They're a way of protecting a product from tax. So why are we talking about this now? The answer is very simple. The end of the tax year is coming up for an individual. The tax year ends on the 5th of April, and a new one starts on the 6th of April. So we're currently in the tax year 2010-2011, and ISAs work on a use it or lose it basis. So if you don't use this year's ISA allowance, come the 5th of April, you've lost it and you can't get it back. You can't make a retrospective claim. Um, it works on a use it or lose it basis. So what is an ISA? What can you put inside this tax wrapper? And the answer is you have a, you have a choice. So um, you can choose to protect cash in an ISA. The idea here is you put um, cash, for example, into a deposit account or a bank account. That's not the ISA bit, that's just a standard account you're opening um, with a decent interest rate. And by putting an ISA around the outside, you shield any interest income that you earn from tax. So cash is one possibility, and then what I'll loosely call stocks and shares are another. And those need to be per the rules eligible. So the idea here is that you could pop um, some stocks and shares into an ISA and uh, provided you don't breach the limit, they are then protected from tax. Two in particular we'll look at in a moment. Um, income tax on dividends, if you're talking about shares, and also capital gains tax, because unlike a bank account, of course, you hope these are going to increase in value. So how much could you stick into an ISA before the deadline on the 5th of April this year? And the answer is, any time you like, you don't have to do it today or tomorrow, you need to do it before the year ends, you can put a maximum of £10,200 in. Now that limit's going to rise next year. The um, government normally tweak it, so it goes up a little bit, starting on the 6th of April for the new tax year. Well, that's your maximum amount you can put into an ISA and shelter from tax. And the way it works is as follows. <clears throat> if you wanted to, you could put the full £10,200 into stocks and shares, as long as they meet the eligible criteria. Eligible, by the way, means that they meet the taxman's rules for being sheltered within a NICER. So if you're shopping for shares of the London Stock Exchange, for example, um, you can include FTSE 100 shares, FTSE 250 shares, in other words, anything on the official list, but you can't include alternative investment market shares. It's not just the London Stock Exchange either. You can include shares on most what are called recognised investment exchanges, uh, and that can include some overseas shares and so on. But just be careful. Make sure you check with your broker that what you're trying to include is eligible for ISA treatment. Now, I could choose to put up to £10,200 into stocks and shares. I can do it in one lump, or I can do it in tranches, but I need to get it in there before the 5th of April. Or I could put a maximum, at the moment, of £5,100 into a bank account, 
protect that with an ISA wrapper, and then put the rest of the account total for the year into stocks and shares. So I could do a 50-50 split. The important point to note is that this is a maximum. So for example, I could have zero on the left, 10,200 on the right. I can do 50-50. I could do 2,000 here and the balance there, but the cash component can't exceed 5,100. Okay, so what are these tax breaks I keep talking about? Let's be specific now about what exactly we mean by an ISA shelters your investment from tax. Well, there are basically four taxes that most investors worry about. And here they are. The first one is for people who buy shares, the stamp duty, usually paid at half a percent on the purchase price. Then for bank accounts that pay interest, bonds that pay interest, for example, shares with dividends, there's income tax. Uh, the rate varies uh, according to how much you earn. Then there's capital gains tax, or CGT. Again, the rate varies. This is the tax on profits. So you don't pay capital gains tax on a bank account because there is no capital gain. But on shares, if they go up in value, then you would. And the maximum rate at the moment is 28%. Then there's inheritance tax. The tax you pay that if you, if you die, for example, leave behind assets in a debtor state, including stocks and shares and bank accounts and so on, those get added together. And then the uh, people you leave behind, your executor and so on, will have to account for tax at 40%. So what's an ISA going to protect you from? And the answer is these two. So what that means is open up a bank account, pop an ISA around it, and you won't pay any tax, income tax that is, on your interest income. Equally, pop, say, £10,200 into a stocks and shares ISA, stick the ISA wrapper around the top, and you won't be paying income tax on dividends or capital gains tax when you sell. However, be careful, you will still pay stamp duty when you buy the shares, and were you to die, ISA shares, indeed ISA assets generally, form part of your death estate. They don't escape. But nonetheless, two useful exemptions there on the tax front. Okay, anything else to know about an ISRA from an administration point of view? And then we'll finally end up with the question, should you get one? Okay, first off, administration points. As a couple, you get two. So a couple can have £10,100 each, sheltered by their own ISAs. So that's quite handy. Next thing to think about is how you get the money in. Um, you've got to get it in before the 5th of April. You can either do it as one lump sum, or you can drip feed it in. So obviously, the earlier you start in the tax year, the more time you've got to drip it in on, say, a monthly basis. Be careful with withdrawals. If you change your mind, you lose subsequent tax breaks. Now, some people get confused here. You can take money out of most ISAs, unless there's a kind of term penalty applied, unless you're looking at, say, a fixed bank deposit, you can withdraw money from an ISA whenever you like. But here's the catch. If you do that, you can't then change your mind and take the tax breaks again. Effectively, as soon as you withdraw money, you lose the right to any future tax breaks on that money. You don't lose the right to use next year's ISA allowance, but you would lose the right to, to take any further tax breaks on the money you've just withdrawn. So think carefully before you withdraw money from an ISA, but also don't panic about it being locked away, because on most ISAs it isn't. All right, so do I want an ISA? Uh, the answer is, for cash, of course you do. Um, it's a bit silly not to. OK, interest rates on cash deposits are not fantastic. Uh, the average ISA rate being quoted at the moment in interest terms is just over 2%, about 2.3%. But it is tax-free. I mean, why pay tax on, say, £5,100 of cash when you don't have to. So cash ISAs make a lot of sense. And um, on the stocks and shares side, be careful. Don't rush out and set up an ISA simply for the tax breaks. You want to make sure you're picking the right investments first, get that right, and then, of course, put the tax wrap around the outside. So choose your investments carefully. You can include, under the eligible investments banner, you can include shares, quite a few bonds, funds, such as exchange-traded funds, 
but don't just rush out and buy any old rubbish simply to get the tax breaks. Okay, so ISA season is upon us. Um, you want to get organised because the 5th of April can come around pretty quickly and you don't want to rush into making investment choices for stocks and shares ISAs that you might regret later. And here's another reason to think about it now. Um, ISA providers, the people who sell these things, will start to market their products. They'll start to realise we're coming towards the deadline for getting ISAs set up for this tax year. So if you're looking for a cash ISA, for example, you could consider waiting a little while um, because some of the best offers often appear just ahead of that 5th of April deadline. So maybe worth having a look around, uh, just keeping an eye out for the best deal and then pouncing. And another thing is, um, I wouldn't lock your money up for more than about a year at the moment. There are some good deals around. Um, some of the better interest rates, for example, are offered on term deposits. But I wouldn't lock your money up for too long. And that's because interest rates are generally forecast to rise. So if you lock your money into an ISA, now you may regret the decision later if interest rates rise and better deals come around when it's time to use next year's ISA allowance.